When we think about our own intuition, you know, most people on this planet say, why am I here? What's my purpose? How do I follow my gut? I don't even know, you know, I'm so out of, out of tune with myself. I've never been in tune with myself. So what do you want to share with people when it comes to intuition? I'm a huge fan of intuition. I literally live my life with my intuition. And looking back, I was always intuitive, but I, you know, probably as a very like a young adult or a child, I didn't really know what it was. Um, and no one teaches you to, to trust your gut, do they? Everything, well, certainly, you know, when I was at school and university was very much about logical learning. I think when I was a junior doctor, one of my seniors said to me, you've got really good judgment. And I just had a sense that that doesn't always come from the knowing mind and the facts and the data. It comes from having seen patterns and recognizing them. And even everything you learn at medical school, you don't remember it all consciously all the time. And certainly you don't remember everything you've experienced in your whole life, but you pick up life lessons. And there's so much I could say here. I, I don't know what order to say it in, but I'll get, I'll get it all there. So there's something called Hebbian learning, which is named after the neuroscientist Donald Hebb. That's essentially that phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. And so the longer ago that something was, or the not so obvious that it was, you've still experienced it and it's still been, you know, wired into your neurons, but it tends to get pushed deeper. And that's where it's what we call, you know, more subconscious or non-conscious. So in the outer cortex of the brain, which is more planning and predicting and logic, um, we, we hold, you know, the information and memories that we need to live our daily life. The intuit intuition and emotion are deeper in the limbic system of the brain. And that's the deep part of the brain that's the size of your clenched fist and then you have your cortex around it. There's a huge neuronal connection between the limbic system and the gut. So we believe that even less conscious material is stored in the brainstem, the spinal cord and the gut neurons. And that's why intuition is also known as, as gut instinct. The, the main reason that people don't know whether to trust it or not is that for a, the longest time, until very recently really, we didn't believe that it was actually a thing. Again, it's only since we've been able to scan brains and understand about the different systems in the brain and the connection with the gut that we've really understood that intuition is another form of data, just like logic, just like emotion, just like motivation, that not only can we access it, but we can also hone it. For me, journaling was the way that I honed my intuition. Um, and I literally started off by thinking, I, you know, I'd be in a certain um, place and need to make a decision. And if logic and intuition are aligned, then there's no issue, is there? But it was when they weren't. And the best examples I have of this, and it'd be interesting to hear what you say about this, is when you've got a friend that it, you can see that the relationship that they're in is not good for them and it's breaking down and it's probably going to end, but they are clinging on and trying to make it last. They're super unhappy, but they just want to stay in the relationship and they don't want to have a breakup or be single and they feel like they're never going to meet anyone again. So what often happens in retrospect is that friends will say, you know, I knew that it wasn't going to last and I should have left earlier, but at the time, because there's so much emotion going on, it all just gets blurred and scary and, you know, you don't make, you don't listen to your inner voice. Um, so if you can write down an example of a conflict there between your logic and your intuition, and in the lowest risk version of that, go with your intuition instead of your logic, if you would normally go with your logic and just see what happens and write it down and, and just prove to yourself whether that is a voice that you can really trust and then build up and, you know, obviously, like I've said, prefer, preferably they're aligned. But if they're not, see if you can take the risk, you know, with a bigger thing next time and, and, and just give yourself permission for that to be another way for you to think. Would intuition be considered the same as being in presence? So you said something earlier that I really loved, which is that when you were doing your inner work, you were, you know, thinking with your head and your heart. I take that one step further and say head, heart and gut. So that's basically 
your logic, your emotions and your intuition being aligned. What exactly was the word phrase that you used about intuition? I was just, as you were talking about it, it, it kind of made me think of being in the present, right? Because yeah. in intuition, like when I think about, and this is, I, this is so random and I've never shared, I don't know if I've ever shared this with anyone before. And it's such a sort of silly thing. But when I was in elementary school, so which is around like, I want to say 10 or 11, fifth grade, I could always tell when, did you ever see the movie Mean Girls? I don't think so. Uh, there's, there's a part in which one of the girls, it, it, she, there's something in her body and she's like, I think it's going to be bad weather, but it, it's kind of a joke. Okay, it? yeah. But my collarbones would start to really hurt. And I could always tell that a big storm was coming in wow. like a day or two before. So I've always been very tuned in. I then got disconnected from myself. And just as you were saying, the word or the, the phrase intuition to presence and the, the intersection of those. For me, I would use the word alignment, but I think we're basically saying exactly the same thing. And I agree, you do have to be in touch with your body to access that voice. Um, I love that quote from Rumi, there's a voice that doesn't use words, listen. Um, that, that to me embodies the feeling of when I experience my intuition. So yeah, being connected to your physical body, and I'm glad you raised the point that actually having your gut physically in good condition aligns with that. Because if you're bloated or you've got poor digestion, that that's when you feel clouded in terms of your intuition. So all the things that are good for your body generally are good for your gut. So basically eat right um, and, and some of the more, more things than what you mentioned are stress, antibiotics, processed food. Um, they all can impact your gut microbiome. Um, and you know, sleep enough, drink enough water. Physical exercise also improves your gut microbiome and managing your stress, obviously. And just like you, I actually stopped meditating during the pandemic because I decided that I wanted my whole life to be mindful. Um, and if you meditate, let's say for half an hour a day, then you're super mindful for half an hour and you're not for 23 and a half hours. Um, and I'm not saying that 100% of my day is mindful, but I try to have as many mindful moments throughout the day as I can, whether that's mindful eating, mindful cooking, mindful walking. And and attention is a really important one. So I don't know if you know Professor Amishi Jha, she does her research on attention and mindfulness. And I interviewed her for my MIT um, online program. And we were just chatting ahead of the interview. And then, you know, when we were ready to start and I was going to ask the first question, her entire demeanor changed. And she was just like 100% present. Um, and I remember thinking, wow, if that's what research on attention does for you, I would like a piece of that, please. <laughs> um, so I think your version of that is presence. My version of that is alignment. And for everybody that's listening, they'll probably have a different word for it. But it's about getting to that point of understanding that intuition is a real thing. It's as valid as logic. Um, and it's the potential that you have within yourself to access that is huge. Can we manifest bad things into our life because of our subconscious or our nervous system. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a really important point about neuroplasticity. I mostly love to say neuroplasticity is hope and potential, but neuroplasticity can, you know, it's anything that you repeat and that has emotional intensity will get embedded into your brain more. So obsessing over a breakup, you can imagine that all that's going to do is give you evidence that you should never you know, get into a relationship and give someone your heart again because they'll break it. Um, and so what the brain does, and this is a safety mechanism, is that when you're about to take one of those risks, like you said, leave your job, leave your relationship, move countries or whatever, the amygdala and the hippocampus, so the amygdala is where the emotions arise from and the hippocampus is where we store memories, they will get together and bring up every negative memory of anything like that that you've done before. So it will be, well, remember the last time you went through a breakup. Remember when you asked your boss for a raise and he said no. 
Um, think of that poor girl that moved to, you know, America and then her life. Why does it do? I mean, I'm assuming this happens in a split second mm. on its own. Do we know why that happens? Yes, because anything new or uncertainty is the biggest threat to the brain. So the brain will always try to keep you in the safest possible place. And so for the brain, when it's working in that primitive way, which it does more when we're under stress, you taking any risk is not safe. So it will try to prevent you from taking risks. And that's when you really have to get the strength from all of those sorts of exercises to override that and say, there is a step that I can take that is a healthy risk that could actually lead to a much better life. Um, and the other explanation I love for that is we've talked a lot about cortisol and stress and they correlate with emotions like fear, anger, shame, disgust, sadness. So, and disgust is a really important one because if we didn't experience disgust for food that was kind of, you know, turning bad when we lived in the cave, we could have died off as a species. So it's quite inbuilt and all of those things that you've mentioned, like never having a relationship again, running out of money, being a failure, they're all associated with shame, self disgust and shame. But when you choose to take a healthy risk, you do everything that you can, whether it's the psychological work, whether it's somatic work, whether it's, you know, asking yourself, is that actually a fact? Um, and you move your brain from the cortisol state to the oxytocin state, which is the state of love and trust and joy and excitement. And I know that some of those are some of your favorite words. Um, when you're operating on that basis, You've got resources flowing around your brain, you know, in the blood supply, and you're much more likely to take a healthy risk, trust, um, see the positive side, you know, potential of things. So in terms of the nervous system, yes, it can do that to you. But also if you can do as many of the things as you can to keep your nervous system in the, you know, rest and, and rejuvenate and love and trust state, then you're more likely to grasp the opportunities that could lead you towards the things that you want. And so that's manifesting. And if you're unable to do that for periods of your life, you know, and, and examples of that are you know, divorce or work stress or um, an adjustment to living in a different country. When, when you're in that state, it is harder to do those things. But there's two ways to look at it. One is that you can build in practices now that keep you more resilient. Or when you're in a you know difficult place, you can start those practices. The science shows that it still helps. So, you know, Amishi Jha's work was with the US Marines and some practice mindfulness for months before, you know, being deployed into a war zone and some didn't, but then they started when they got there and they, they also had benefits. So, you know, it's, it's never too late, but it is about doing as many small things as you can. So rather than one big thing, small things like what I've mentioned, having salt baths, meditating, or you know, bringing mindfulness moments into your life, um, sleeping and waking at regular times, having good people around you, um, all of those things can set you up more. And you know, yesterday when we were texting, I said, you know, you're incredibly beautiful. Now you're obviously incredibly beautiful, but I said it because I thought, maybe she's not feeling that way right now. And so I just want to say that because I know it will make her feel good. And, you know, I've also got two friends who I've, I've mentioned to you, the two that are coming around tomorrow, um, who just out of the blue sent me, eat, they don't know each other, just separately, sent me like a really, really loving message. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. You know, that's just such a gift. It makes you always feel good. And I found out with both of them that they were going through a really tough time. But their choice at that time was to reach out to someone with love. And I've learned, you know, I've learned that from them. I, I do that more now because I saw them do it to me. It's because it's just so easy when you're feeling low or stressed to not turn to love and, and focus on the negative thoughts. So again, that's another neuroplasticity journey that, you know, I, this is why I do podcasts because I would love more people to feel that they have that choice.